My dear brother, how you doing there? Good evening. I'm David Lee of the English Department. Welcome to the Collins Distinguished Speaker Series. This ongoing public humanities project devotes itself to contemporary world culture and politics. Since its inception, writers and thinkers of renown have graced this podium. Among them, Pulitzer Prize winning novelist Viet Nguyen and Juno Diaz, National Book Award winners Ha Jin and Maxine Hong Kingston, and the champion of global social justice, Noam Chomsky. Today, Cornel West, activist, intellectual, and professor of philosophy at Harvard, will address us shortly. I read Professor West's Race Matters about a quarter century ago when this groundbreaking volume was fresh off the press and I was an assistant professor at the University of Southern California. The book has had a formative influence on my scholarly trajectory, providing me with the model of vigorous thinking. Race, as I often remind my students, is not a thing but a relationship. It is biological irrelevance with fatal social consequences. Mm -hmm. It is not about symbolic representation and the feel-good respect. It is about equality in the exercise of rights and responsibilities and in the access to political, economic, and cultural power. It is about the citizenry's ownership of democracy and its deprivatization. Race matters today and it matters differently for different races. For it reinforces over time, through repetition and variation, the boundaries of settlers and natives, masters and slaves, citizens and aliens, Ellis Island and Andrew Island, from the institutional investment in whiteness to the current racial politics of the White House. Mm. For a cogent understanding of the multi-dimensions of race and other matters, both stateside and abroad. Let us give a warm welcome to our distinguished speaker tonight, Professor Cornell West. This is it. Uh, thank you so very much. I want to begin by giving a salute to my dear brother David Lee, Professor David Lee and his magisterial scholarship. Oh yes, on empire, on nation. And I want to salute each and every one of you for coming out tonight. I look forward to our dialogue. I hope I say something that thoroughly unsettles you. <laughs> and unnerves you maybe even for a moment. Unhouses you. Uh, to come to the University of Oregon, I must say, it showed my own parochial origins in Sacramento, California. When I was growing up, my end of name was to be a athlete and a track star, and there was a brother named Steve Prefontaine who was my hero. <laughs> my brother actually ran against Steve Prefontaine. My brother still holds the mile record for freshman at UC Berkeley, and he ran cross country with Steve Prefontaine, and we had some just magnificent moments and memories of Prefontaine. I know he's a legend here in this region and so forth, but we knew him as a human being. We knew him as someone who exemplified what the Greeks would call arate, which is excellence, unbelievable discipline, and sharing that a sense of accomplishment with us. And so I do begin on that personal note. For me, this is a very difficult uh, night because I've just lost my mentor. His name was Martin Kielsen. He was the first black tenured professor in the history of Harvard University. Harvard University was founded in 1636. He was tenured in 1969. So much for the vicious legacy of white supremacy at Harvard University. But he meant the world to me. I was 17 years old when I first met him, making my trek from the chocolate side of Sacramento, California, all the way to the vanilla side of Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> and he embraced me. 
he affirmed me. And it, it's something that we never forget, especially as you get older, that I am who I am because somebody loved me. When you talk about race matters, this is not some abstract discourse. This is not a matter of being clever or smart. It's a matter of wrestling with the most fundamental question that we'll ever have to wrestle with, which is what does it mean to be human? And what kind of human being are we going to choose to be? So when you talk about race matters, yes, you get to the structural, yes, you get to the institutional, but it's very important to begin with the existential, the lived experience. The highest honor I've ever received in my life is being the second son of Clifton and Irene West. That I'll never be the human being my father was. My mother's still going at 87 years old. There's an elementary school named after her, Irene B. West, right on the outskirts of Sacramento, California, where I was born. She's the first grade teacher, principal. And then the collection of that West family with Cliff and Cynthia and Cheryl, with Shiloh Baptist Church and Reverend Willie P. Cook and Deacon Hinton. These are names, these are people caught within white supremacist bombardment, but mustering forms of weaponry, intellectual, moral, political, spiritual weaponry, tied to bonds of sympathy and ties of empathy. That's for me where race matters begins. And yes, I'm blessed to go to Harvard and meet magnificent teachers. It was the golden age of Harvard philosophy department when I arrived. John Rawls and W.V. Quine and Robert Nozick, my tutor, and Hillary Putnam and Nelson Goodman and Rogers Alberton and Stanley Cavell. Oh, what an intellectual feast. And at that point, I'd already given up on being a track star, you can imagine. <laughs> I'm just a failure on that re in that regard. But what an intellectual feast. But at the same time, moving directly to Jamaica Plain and working in the Black Panther Party breakfast program. Every morning, every morning. And every Sunday after church at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, they made me the superintendent of the Sunday school. So we had a fascinating dialectic between Jesus and Franz Fanon. <laughs> fascinating. Drop in a little Hegel. Dialectic of recognition. And then on Sundays, off to Norfolk prison. I taught there for three years. In fact, when I first got back to Harvard two years ago, I went to Norfolk Prison for the first time in 45 years. And I was hit so hard to see my dear brother Richard, the same brother I had been going to see 45 years before he's still there. Gray hair, walking with a stick. We just shed tears. I say, Brother Richard, you a stronger human being than I am. You wrestling with the same question. What does it mean to be human? Because each and every one of us, as Franz Kafka reminds us, have a death sentence in space and time. And in that sense, we're on a continuum with our precious and priceless brothers and sisters of all colors, disproportionately chocolate, incarcerated. That human continuity that links us, our fate, our sense of a future in that regard. And so I always remind myself the degree to which I'm just a moment in a tradition, a contingent extension of a heritage. And yes, I do come from a people who have been terrorized for 400 years and yet has taught the world so much about freedom. 
at our best, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, refused to terrorize those who had terrorized us. And you and I know if the dominant form of black leadership had been one of counter-terrorization against the vicious forms of terrorization coming at us, there would be no America. There would have been civil war every generation. There'd be terrorist cells in every chocolate side of town. But no black versions of the Ku Klux Klan became the dominant form of leadership in terms of wrestling with this question of what does it mean to be human? A lot of times I just go to different contexts and I tell my vanilla brothers and sisters, I say when you see black people, you ought to just give them a standing ovation. <laughs> just give them a standing ovation. It's true. Thank you for not opting just to terrorize back. Thank you for attempting to ascend to a higher moral and spiritual ground as you had to deal with 244 years of white supremacist slavery where the average slave would be dead at 27 years old torture every day from sun up to sun down and yet there labor would produce the wealth which is the precondition of the mark of the democracy with the fundamental presupposition and precondition which is of course our precious indigenous brothers and sisters and their land their children their women their men so let us never ever say that slavery was America's original sin. That's just a typical neoliberal gesture <laughs> of trying to understand race as simply a democratic deficit. No, it was the treatment of indigenous people which is the original sin, which means America begins as empire rather than democratic experiment. Yeah. Very important starting point, vantage point to understand how you talk about the constructions of race and how they change over time, the various iterations and elaborations and articulations of this dynamic concept of race, always already connected to empire, always already connected to predatory capitalist expansion, always already connected to forms of patriarchal practices, on and on and on, the homophobic practices, the transphobic factors, losing sight of the humanity of Jewish brothers and sisters and Arab brothers and sisters and Muslim brothers and sisters. We could go on and on and on. And this is not PC chit chat. This is Veritas, a quest for truth. And the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak in our individual lives, in our community, in our precious experiment in democracy, in our imperial journey, allowing truth to speak. That's one reason why the very anthem of black people in this country is what? Lift every, exactly, lift every, Voice. It doesn't say lift every echo, does it? We're not talking about imitations and copies. We're talking about people trying to be originals, distinct, singular, finding their voices just like a blue woman and a jazz man. You, you can't hit the stage if you haven't really found your voice. And William Butler Yeats is right. It takes more courage the deep, dig deep into the dark corners of your own soul than it does for a soldier to fight on the battlefield. That's how you find your voice. 400 years of being hated individually, systemically, chronically, institutionally, and yet 
the best of the black tradition is what? Teaching the world so much about love. I could just turn on John Coltrane's The Love Supreme right now and sit down. <laughs> just, just, just let you take it in. Well, I could read passages from Toni Morrison's Be Loved. A love so thick that it takes the form of the killing of your precious baby because you don't want your baby dirtied and thingified by white supremacist persons, practices, institutions, structures. I could read the love-soaked essays of James Baldwin, the son of Harlem, never went to college, but at least two colleges went through him. <laughs> when he would say over and over again, love forces us to take off the mask we know we cannot live within, but fear we cannot live without. Courage, interrogation. There's never been a figure on the American stage, given all of the genius and talent of a Eugene O'Neill and probably the greatest indictment ever written of the American empire and the Iceman cometh. Or Tennessee Williams, or Arthur Miller, August Wilson, or Adrian Kennedy, but I'm talking about Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun. Has there ever been a figure with more love than mama on the American stage? Five generations enacted in her attempt to bequeath and to transmit what the Isley brothers would call a caravan of love to that younger generation. Walter teach Travis in light of old man Walter, you all know the play, who died, who bequeathed $10,000 to see whether they'll get to that vanilla suburb or not. But that's not the end and aim of it. The aim is measuring people based on their courageous attempt to cultivate the capacity to think for themselves to learn how to love and to laugh and to hope. I could turn on Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. <laughs> Every note and the silence between the notes. Save the babies. Who really cares? Stevie Wonder's love and the need of love. But this love that we're talking about, again, is not abstract. It is concrete, and it is as real as a heart attack. And it has something to do with the Socratic legacy of Athens. It has something to do with line 38a of Plato's Apology. The unexamined life is not worth living. And we know the Greek actually said the unexamined life is not a life of the human. And we know our English word human comes from the Latin humando, which means what? Burial and burying. We're beings on the way to death. And you can't talk about race matters. You can't talk about what it means to be human without talking about wrestling with forms of death and what it means to be on intimate f relations with forms of death. Early physical death indeed, but also social death. That 244 years of white supremacist slavery attempt to make them socially dead in the language of the great Orlando Patterson in his 1982 classic, Slavery and Social Death. Unsuccessful resistance, resilience still kicks in, but the attempt to impose a social death, and then a psychic death. What is psychic death? Well, for black people in the modern world, it has to do with trying to wrestle against the forces of niggerization. Because the niggerize the people just try to convince them they're less beautiful. They're less intelligent. 
they're less moral, to instill in them unbelievable fear, to instill in them this sense that they ought to be scared all the time and intimidated all the time, laughing when it ain't funny, scratching when it don't itch. Wearing the mask, as Paul Lawrence Dunbar said it in his great poem. That's why one of the most powerful sentences in James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time is that line in the letter to the nephew, don't, comma, be afraid. That's why Marcus Garvey would always have a black person in front of every major demonstration with a big sign, the Negro is not afraid, even if they're sitting there shaking, carrying the sign. Yeah. It's why the great Mary Ellen Pleasant who was the first black woman millionaire in America, known as the mother of human rights in California. She happened to be a black domestic maid who married a white robber baron, and he dropped dead. <laughs> she got all his money, and she didn't kill him. It was a natural thing. <laughs> but never forget Mary Ellen Pleasant. She gave $800,000 to a white brother named John Brown. That's how he survived financially on his way to Harper's Ferry. And she would start every lecture all over California with the line, I'd rather be a corpse than a coward. Just like Martin Luther King Jr. would always say to his staff, I'd rather be dead than afraid, wrestling with what it means to be human, being on intimate forms with death, and the echoes going back to Plato when he says philosophy itself is a meditation on and preparation for death. Philo Sophia, love of wisdom, meditation on preparation for death. And even Seneca, and we don't expect too much profundity from the Romans, they're so busy running an empire, very much like we Americans. He used to say, he or she who learns how to die unlearns slavery. And I've told my students for 41 years of my very blessed life of teaching, when you come in my classroom, you hear to learn how to die. And they say, well, Brother West, I thought I was just taking a philosophy class and <laughs> to read some text and get a grade. No, no, this is paideia. This is P-A-I-D-E-I-A. -E this is deep education. This is not cheap schooling. So when you're talking about race matters, you're not just talking about skill acquisition and information. You're talking about self-interrogation and social transformation. And the best in the University of Oregon, with all of the challenges that go along with any institution of higher learning in our late capitalist civilization that's undergoing commodification, corporatization, bureaucratization, rationalization, making it more and more difficult for any kind of paideia to take place. But the students come in so pre-professional. Can't wait to make their movement to the professor. No, you got to learn how to think first. No, you got to learn how to laugh first. You got to learn how to play first. You got to learn how to wrestle with what it means to be human. I'll get to that later on. I just need my skill. Oh, <laughs> what makes you think any democracy can survive based on dominant forces of corporatization, commodification, bureaucratization, and rationalization in the Weberian sense? You're going to end up, as Du Bois said so powerfully in, in the souls of black folk, caught in the dusty desert of smartness and dollars. And in many ways, that's where we are. I don't know about the University of Oregon, but back at Harvard, oftentimes the highest thing a student can say about themselves is they're the smartest in the room. And I tell them, let the phones be smart. You be wise. <laughs> yes. The fetishizing of smartness tied to richness, how spiritually empty, how morally vacuous, 
and most importantly, reinforcing the worst protocols of professional culture, which is conformity, complacency, and when you and it's time to actually act cowardliness. Because the careerism and the opportunism is so overwhelming. Thank God for Socrates. Thank God for all of those who are willing to first begin with themselves. Self-examination, self-interrogation. And when you give up an assumption or presupposition, when you give up a dogma or a doctrine, that's a form of death. And there is no education without that kind of death. There's no maturation without that kind of death. That's what learning how to die is all about. One of the great eulogies ever written, one sentence, a sister named Dorothy Day, one of the great prophetic figures of the 20th century. She's my fellow Catholic sister. When Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered April 4th, 1968, in her historic newspaper, Catholic worker. She said, Martin Luther King Jr. learned how to die daily, to continually grow, continually mature, and it's endless. It is perennial, and you always end up in a moment of inadequacy, almost an echo of our great lapse, Protestant artistic genius Samuel Beckett, when he said, you try again, fail again, fail better. Try again, fail again, fail better. That's the best that we can do. But you're continually in process, calling yourself into question, interrogating whatever assumptions you are falling back on. That Socratic energy at its highest level. To come to terms with race matters is to begin with self, always already tied to society, always already tied to forms of death, forms of dogma, and forms of domination. To be human is to wrestle with those inescapable and unavoidable realities, to drop any linguistically conscious primate like ourselves in time and space means you're going to have to wrestle with forms of death. First bodily extinction, the psychic and spiritual death, possibly civic death, and forms of patriarchy, class-based, could be empire, colonized peoples, but then dogma, ideological dogma, religious dogma, political dogma, scientific dogma. You say, Brother West, how can it be scientific dogma? To be scientific is to always be concerned about questioning. Read the history of science. <laughs> Just read it closely. And the great John Dewey always made a distinction between scientific method and scientific temper. The method itself can become a dogma. It's like skepticism. If you're not skeptical about skepticism, you get locked into a certain kind of skepticism. <laughs> and in the end, it becomes a matter of adolescent activity because skepticism usually presupposes the vantage point of a spectator, whereas criticism is, is one of a participant. So you can play all kind of games as a spectator, but when you are involved, when it comes to your house and your loved ones, all of a sudden things shift, and that's one of the great stories of white supremacy in the United States. So oftentimes people can be in a state of denial 
Look at the U.S. Constitution. Any reference to the institution of white supremacist slavery? No. 22% of the inhabitants of the 13 colonies are enslaved. No reference to the institution in your constitution. You're going to end up having a civil war of 750,000 precious people killed over an institution not invoked in your constitution. Well, first of all, that's just a fascinating tension between principle and practice. <laughs> Get off the crack pipe. <laughs> that's called denial. That's called avoidance. That's called thinking, in fact, that you can somehow, through willful ignorance, treat people, conceive of yourself in ways that those effects and consequences won't come back to haunt you. What did Malcolm X call it? Chickens coming home to roost. Sooner or later, you're going to reap what you sow. Sooner or later, what you think you've been able to escape from is going to hunt you down and hunt you down. We're seeing that right now in Imperial America. We end up killing almost a million Muslims and can't say a mumbling word in our public discourse. Invasions of Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan. And then you get the counter terrorists and we wonder why they're upset. Now, terrorism for me needs to be called into question across the board. The innocent life of any human being for me is a crime against humanity. But no serious concern about how many Iraqis died. The same was true with our drones. Innocent folk in Yemen and Somalia and Pakistan and Libya. Afghanistan can die. Kill one American. Brother Barack did what? Had a press conference that same day. Gave economic compensation for the family that same day. And they had already denied that they'd killed any innocent people as a whole. Quit lying. Quit lying. <laughs> Keep track of human beings. Those babies in Yemen and Somalia, those babies in Pakistan, they have exactly the same status and significance as black babies in South Central Los Angeles, as brown babies in East Los Angeles, as white babies in Newtown, Connecticut, as yellow babies in San Francisco. And we like to talk about it in the abstract, but when it comes time to being actually tested in our actions, we live in in Denial. We might as well be in Disney World on Main Street. <laughs> and what's fascinating about Disney World, so stereotypically and quintessentially American, there's a lot of fun there, but there's no life. And there's no life because there's no death. If somebody was about to die in Disney World, you just take them and push them across the line. You, you're going <laughs> to. You're going to besmirch our image. Nobody's supposed to die in Disneyland. Oh, I mean, I'm being facetious. Y'all get the point, though. Escapists, 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 given all of the overwhelming sense of possibility and supposedly prosperity, and yet one out of two of our children, black and brown, under six years old, live in poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world. That's a moral disgrace. Where is the discourse about it? Martin Luther King Jr. turns over in his grave. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel turns over in his grave. Are oh, we actually going to keep track of the underside? Are we going to be Socratic enough that we can keep track of the Conrad-like heart of darkness shot through all of the light of liberty that we talk about in the United States? Or sooner or later, you're going to reap what you sow. Absolutely. And of course, usually the people who raise this issue end up being misunderstood, misconstrued, marginalized, incarcerated, or shot down like a dog. The truth's too much. It's too overwhelming. I'd rather close one's eyes. 
And yet when the crisis comes, ooh, lo and behold, that's why race matters in regard to indigenous peoples, in regard to our precious brown brothers and sisters, moving borders. I grew up in California, used to be Mexico. Read what Ulysses S. Grant says about the Mexican War. Just massive gentrification, a power grab and a land grab across the board. You see, immigration discourse, well, they, they coming home. They coming home, they, that used to be there. Viciously, immorally taken. Our Asian brothers and sisters, the very year in which we have the Statue of Liberty, give me your poor. There's the Chinese Exclusion Act. So much for our universality. And of course, you all here in Oregon, you know about the Black Exclusion Acts of 1844. Is that right? You know about those. Well, they need to know. I'm going to put up a picture. Serious exclusion acts. Black folk can't set foot in Oregon. But we're anti-slavery, yes, but you're anti-black people at the same time. That is highly possible. We human beings, we're so creative when it comes to mistreating each other. <laughs> we be against slavery, but don't want black folk too close. Can't stand the institution but oh, when those lives, human beings, and bodies get close, we're overwhelmed. You see. That's part of the challenge, too. That's why any discussion about race is never simply a discussion about policy, structural institution, as crucial as structural institutions are. But it's also about the ways in which subjectivities are constructed, the ways in which individuals are created. And then the choices that people make, not just as persons, but in collectivities, in groups, in communities. And that's one of the reasons why the best of the University of Oregon or any other institution of higher learning has to put such a stress on that Socratic legacy of Athens, that paideia. And that line 24a of Plato's Apology, where Socrates says, parhesia is the cause of my unpopularity. What is parhesia? P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. -E Frank speech, fearless speech, plain speech, unintimidated speech. The education at its highest level is about fusing the formation of our wise attention with the cultivation of our critical thinking that's linked to the maturation of compassionate and courageous people. Now, we raise the question, is courage a dominant virtue in our universities? Hell no. No, it's not at all. It's about smartness. It's about status. And too often arrogance and condescension. Courage is tied to fortitude. Fortitude is tied to a certain humility. Like Socrates, I know that I know more than others precisely because I know that I know nothing. And they think they know something they do not know. Intellectual humility, personal humility, but it's tied also to a tenacity. I'm going to raise whatever is inside of me to think for myself, as Kant put it in what is Enlightenment of 1784. The release from self-incurred tutelage, the, the release from self-imposed immaturity, dare to think for yourself. That's what it is to find the voice of my own black tradition. You see. So when Monk tells Coltrane, 
You've been imitating Johnny Hodges of the Duke Ellington band too much, John. It's time for you to find your voice. What does train sound like? I don't know how many of you all have had a chance to see uh, Amazing Grace. Has that hit Eugene yet? Yeah, just with Aretha, 29 years old, walks into James Cleveland's church and raises her voice. And who's on the front row? Not just her father, Reverend C.L. Franklin, one of the finest of all preachers enacting such a grand oratorical art. But Clara Ward, and Echoes of Marianne Williams, those who Aretha imitated until she found her voice. I don't know if many of y'all got a chance to see Homecoming yet by Beyonce. Oh, we got some, we, we got some queen bee, beehives up in here. Ooh, sookie, sookie now. Yeah. So what does she do when she enters predominantly white space? She brings her whole crew with her, doesn't she? She brings the whole culture with her. 200 musicians linked to historically black college performances. And the performances are not mere entertainment. Each one of them are lifting their voices just like Duke Ellington's orchestra, just like James Brown's band, just like the musicians in Sly Stone's group. Each one finding their voice and they bounce off against each other. Ralph Ellison called it antagonistic cooperation. Because <laughs> it's not competition in the market driven sense. I'm so good and you sounding so bad. No, grow up. We in this together. And most importantly, kenosis. And this is what oftentimes is missing in any serious talk about race matters, especially in the academy, but even outside. Now, what is kenosis? K-E-N-O-S-I-S. Kenosis is self-emptying, self-donating, self-giving. It's like the end of a James Brown concert when he comes out and says, I'm an extension of you, you're an extension to me, I've just given you three and a half hours of all that I Am. Did anybody come here to play, to hear a song we did not play? You didn't play Soul Power, James. He said, hit it, Bootsy. <laughs> because you come to serve. You're not a spectacle. Should I go to some of these concerts with these young brothers and sisters, still highly talented, and all that spectacle hits? I think I went to one of Usher's concerts. That Negro was flipping over like he was in a circus. I said, pick up the microphone and sing a song, Negro. I didn't come here for all this mess. Spectacle. That's late capitalist culture. Image, spectacle, superficiality. Titillation, stimulation. All Aretha Franklin needs is a microphone. She sits down, is that, my, my, is that right, my sister? She sits down on that piano, and what does she do? Within three minutes, she even touched you and parts of your soul you forgot about. Because she has mastered her craft and her technique in such a way, but she's there to give. She's there to enable. She says to empower. She wants people to leave feeling as if they can take on deaths in its forms, domination and its forms, dogma and its forms, and be ready to die with dignity physically, and then hope your afterlife will be at work in the lives of those who come after. Oh, what a great conception of what it is to be human. Black folk have no monopoly on this. This is a human thing across the board. You see it in the 12th paragraph of Vico's New Science where he talks about humando, all human beings in the face of grief and death must objectify that grief and through their moans and groans transfigure it into sound, then poetry, then language, then sight science and maybe be able to pass it on to the next generation so they will be able to live lives of some decency and dignity. It's the history of our species and all of our wretchedness and all of our wonderfulness. James Baldwin used to say, every human being I've met is a disaster. <laughs> That's what he says at the very beginning of No Name in the Street of 1972, but then he goes on to say, but they're also a miracle. 
And the challenge is, how do you keep track of those disasters without forgetting that they're also miracles? Well, some of y'all may know that very well in your relationships. I'm not going to ask for testimony, though. <laughs> It's a very human thing. But when you're talking about race matters, first you got to come up with how does any culture produce a Harriet Tubman? What goes into the soul craft? What kind of paideia? What kind of parhesia? What kind of phronesis? What kind of practical wisdom? What kind of courage? What kind of fortitude? Where does Martin King come from? Where does Malcolm X come from? And we can say the same thing on other parts of, uh, other sides of town too. But any talk about race matters that tries to accent our sense of possibility must raise those very, very unsettling questions. And when we look at our present historical moment and the Socratic legacy of Athens, who is raising the most challenging questions, not just about the dysfunctionality of the White House. That's the easiest thing. I mean, it's fairly clear we got a gangster in the White House. I mean, you, you, the, what, the evidence is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. You see, you grab a woman's private parts, that's gangster. See, a country has oil and you want to go get it. That's gangster. Mendacity tied to criminality, tied to obsession with the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> and then when you get caught, who cares? Because it becomes so normalized and you lie enough, it doesn't make any difference after a while. But that's fetishizing one individual. And that particular individual is just a sign and a symptom of something much deeper cuts through all of our institutions and practices and structures. And you see, I'm a revolutionary Christian, so I call Donald Trump my brother. And they say, Brother West, I've said it on television. I said it today on Anderson Cooper. Why are you calling him your brother? You must be losing your cotton-picking mind. <laughs> and I said, no, it's a matter of equipping me and others to recognize He's not, some, he's not some alien. He's on a human continuum. He's simply making choices that I radically call into question. <laughs> it's very important. And actually, really, on a very deep personal level for me as a Christian, I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and now I'm just a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So the gangster in him is inside of me. His white supremacist sensibilities, it's inside of me. To be American is to be shaped by white supremacy. When I look inside of the souls of black people, I see white supremacy. You don't need to have white brothers and sisters around to see white supremacy. That's how deep it cuts. So when I got a white brother and sister coming to me, he said, Brother West, you know, I'm not as racist at all. I've, I've transcended all of that. <laughs> I said, I look inside of me. I've been wrestling with it for 65 years. If I have some, my hunch is you got some work to do. Nobody's pure. Nobody's pristine. The question is, what is the quality of your effort against it? Are you learning how to die? Are you learning how to conquer it every day? When I look inside of me, I see patriarchy. I am a man, and I have been shaped by patriarchal structures in the black church on the corner. Friday, Saturday, sometimes I sneak in Thursday nights in the nightclub. Because I'm a hang loose kind of Christian, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. We got some real ungodly things happening. Exactly. The Holy Ghost goes on vacation. I've also got imperial sensibilities in me. I've got to fight this notion that somehow an American life has more value than a life in Guatemala or Ethiopia or Portugal or Qatar or Trinidad or Jamaica or Barbados. Struggle with it every day. A 
I got to fight this anti-Jewish sensibility inside of me. We don't know of a civilization deeply shaped by Christianity or Islam that has not often lost sight of the humanity of Jewish brothers and sisters going back 2,000 years of the hatred of Jewish brothers and sisters. And then when my Jewish brothers and sisters make their move to the Middle East and they lose sight of the humanity of precious Palestinian brothers and sisters, the same critique, the same attitude, the same orientation, human beings across the board, across the board. And you, it sounds so simple and yet it's so very difficult to raise voice. I don't think any one of us have the solution, capital S, talking about race matters, empire matters, class matters, sexual orientation matters, and so forth. But it's only by lifting voices together, like jazz musicians, learning how to learn and listen, to take it in, to cultivate the faculty of receptivity as much as expressivity. That's always mutual and reciprocal in that regard. That's the raw stuff of democracy. That's what you get in the great work of a Walt Whitman, or the great disciple, creative disciple of Walt Whitman in the 20th century, Mario Rukeyser, of course, the inimitable John Dewey himself, given all of his great insights, but also his blind spots. What do I mean by blind spots? Well, this is the real challenge. How do we engage in Socratic energy connected to the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem, which has to do with Tears. He, Socrates never cries. He never sheds a tear. You all remember Thomas More in the Tower of London right before he's executed, and he writes his dialogues on tribulations, and he raises one of the most fundamental qu queries about Western civilization. Why is it Socrates never cries and Jesus never laughs? <laughs> That's a profound question. Now, it could have been that, that Socrates did cry, and because he never wrote a word, the people who wrote about him didn't pick it up of Plato and Xenophon and Aristophanes and the other. Could have been Jesus was laughing all the time. <laughs> but he never wrote a word either. So they didn't pick it up. But all we have is them rendered through the people who wrote about them. But if Socrates never cries, Jesus weeps. As does Jeremiah in Hebrew scripture. But when you're concerned about the Judaic imperative of sh spreading hesed, loving kindness, steadfast love to the vulnerable, the fatherless, the motherless, the oppressed, the persecuted, you will be shedding tears. And I come from a people who begin with guttural cries. That's why W.B. Du Bois begins his great text of 1903, Souls of Black Folk, with that magnificent poem of Arthur Simmons, who was a vanilla brother and a poet who almost went mad and committed suicide, but he's dealing with something we in this country always hold at arm's length, which is not problems. We're very good at talking about problems and problem solving. Our own indigenous philosophical tradition of pragmatism is obsessed with problems and the problematic situation, but to talk about what race matters is about is to talk about catastrophe. And we must never confuse and conflate the problematic with the catastrophic. The catastrophic. There has never been a indigenous people's problem in this country. They have had catastrophes visited upon them. It's true. There's never been a Negro problem. Lynching, terrorism, these are not problems. These are catastrophes. There's never been a woman's problem. There's been catastrophes visited on women. 
psychically, structurally, institutionally. There's never been a Jewish problem in Europe. There were catastrophes visited on Jewish brothers and sisters. And we can go on and on. Our Armenian problem in Turkey, no, that's a catastrophe. We can go on and on. But the catastrophic is something that rarely is able to make its presence in our discourse, in our universities, in our newspapers, because we rather opt for sanitized, sterilized, deodorized discourses. That's what we like. Whereas the catastrophic is about what? Keeping it funky. Because <laughs> when you keep it funky, you keep it real. When you keep it real, you let all of that stuff come out. Let it all come out. That's one of the reasons why American artists have played such an important role. Because American culture in its dominant form is what? It's the culture of limitless possibility. We can solve any problem. There's no limit that can constrain us. There's no constraint that in any way can belittle us. That's the dominant American discourse. You hear it in every state of the union, whether it's Republican or Democrat. You say, well, why is it that you have no limits? Because we are Americans. What about Lithuanians? Well, no, they got a different situation. <laughs> we are Americans. And then here come our artists. The greatest one of them all, vanilla brother named Herman Melville. Let me tell you something about the American empire in the form of a Pequod of a ship that's obsessed with whiteness and the whiteness of a whale in such a way that they'd rather sell their souls in order to dominate it and in dominate it, rather sacrifice everybody on that ship. And how does that novel end with just the coffin itself as the only slice of the ship left with Ishmael holding on for dear life? We have yet to catch up with Herman Melville. When that novel was published, a few hundred copies were bought. It did not even become popular until the 1920s when Raymond Weaver and Lewis Mumford and others began to say, lo and behold, there's catastrophic realities and we, there's somebody who was talking about that a long time ago. <laughs> you don't say. You don't say. Thank God we got Thomas Pynchon. Thank God we got Tony Morrison. Thank God we got folk who flow out of the Melvillian tradition. But then in my own black tradition, the blues. Ralph Ellison used to say the blues ain't nothing but a personal narrative of a catastrophe lyrically expressed. That's what it is. The king of the blues, B.B. King himself. Nobody loves me but my mama and she might be jiving too. <laughs> Echoes of Sophocles is Antigone, isn't it? All the forces in the world, in the cosmos against you, and the one person you thought you could fall back on <laughs> might be jiving too. And that's the B side of the thrill is gone. <laughs> that's the blues. That's not problematic. That's catastrophic. Strange fruit that southern trees bear. Black bodies swaying in the southern breeze. Those powerful lyrics of a Jewish brother named Maripol who wrote it. And who's singing it? Yeah, exactly. The inimitable sister from Baltimore City, Billie Holiday herself. That's catastrophic. Institutional catastrophe. Neo-slavery called Jim Crow. When you read about it in your textbook, what do they call it? Segregation. That's deodorized discourse. Segregation, please. No, no, this is terrorism. Indigenous peoples will tell you about it. You see? Women be able to tell you about it. Workers will tell you about it when the Pinkertons are bigger than the state militia in Ohio if you go on strike against Rockefeller. And you get crushed. So you don't even have collective bargaining until the 1930s. 
Argentina had it in 1836. They're not known for being on the cutting edge for social justice. <laughs> They're 100 years ahead of America because the rule of capital was so overwhelming. Workers don't have a right to collect. They have to deal with catastrophic circumstances in that. And the challenge is, how do you deal with that catastrophe with the paideia, the parhesia, with the compassion? That's one of the grand contributions of any talk about race matters when it comes to black people. Because in the face of that kind of catastrophe, you're going to still get unbelievable creativity and compassion. And yet that creativity and compassion can be used against you. Because people will think, oh, I see. You loving truth, or trying to love truth and goodness and beauty. And if you're religious, you're trying to love God and trying to love your neighbor. And if you're a serious Christian, you're even trying to love your enemies. Boy, for ruling classes, that's quite a gift, though, isn't it? <laughs> oh, these are subject, these oppressed folk loving me. That's one reason why Martin Luther King Jr. is so popular. You just beat him down. Slap him upside the head, talk about his mama. And what does he say? I'm going to love you anyway. You say this to white brothers and sisters. Yeah, Martin's special kind of Negro. He's a special kind of brother. That's true. But he went to jail 32 times. How many times did he go to jail for white brothers and sisters? Zero. He went to jail for black people. Just when he came out, he said, I love everybody, but I'm going to jail for these unloved people. So when you look at me and preoccupied about yourself or me loving you, you ought to accent the degree to which I'm loving these folk and loving you. But you are not center stage. This is not fundamentally about you just because I'm loving you. Because at the deepest level, of sacrifice. What I'm going to die for are these unloved people. And this is a very important challenge because what has happened in the last 40 years, I know I'm going on and on, we're going to open it up for questions in a minute. In the last 40 years, we've seen conceptions of success, especially black success, that are severed from greatness. Because greatness has to do with the quality of your service to the least of these. The depth and scope of your sacrifice to those catching hell. Success is about spectacle. And oftentimes, one of the ways you can be highly successful, especially for black folk, is to love everybody but black people. Or to love everybody first before you love black people. And I think that's pathological. Something wrong at a deep level. You're so obsessed with the white normative gaze. You're so hungry for white recognition and white approval that that becomes your point of reference. That's one of the reasons why, in fact, our musicians can humanize it. It's a beautiful thing to love anybody, no matter who they are and what color they are, but you're loving them because they're human beings. You're not loving them for their color. You're not loving them for some superficial feature. You're loving them for what kind of soul and character and virtue and vision and values they have been able to hone out both in relation to you and what they brought to the relationship. That's what Martin Luther King, that's what Coltrane, that's what Sarah Vaughan and the others are about. That's why American artists at our best provide some kind of alternative vision of a reality that these days is becoming more and more decadent and more and more rotten. We are experiencing an Im imperial meltdown on a massive scale. In the economic sphere, the grotesque wealth inequality, the political sphere, the, the breakdown of our system, at the cultural and educational sphere, the difficulty of genuine deep education as opposed to cheap schooling, and especially looking inside the souls of our priceless young people of all color. Levels of depression, drug addiction, 
sexual addiction. The kind of things that right-wing Christian evangelicals often make their careers on. They speak into something deep. They just have a very narrow, often cold-hearted articulation of how they wrestle with it. It's a deep emptiness, the melancholia, the sadness. I know we at at Harvard now, we've got something like 21% of our students wrestling with depression. Now, when I went to Harvard 40 years ago, there was about 3.5 wrestling with depression. Now, who trusts statistics, but you know. (laughs) Something has happened. Something is going on in terms of the shattering of the structures of value and feeling in our market-driven culture, obsessed with superficial things, obsessed with the surface. And so the soul stirring, that's where Sam Cooke comes from, the soul stirs. That's where Lou Rawls comes from, the soul stir. We talked about Aretha, she's a soul stirrer. What soul stirs do we have left, especially in the public sphere? And you can't be a soul stirrer unless at least you make an attempt to be committed to integrity and a generosity and a kenosis, an emptying of one's self. People ask me why I spend so much time with Brother Bernie. And Brother, oh no, I love Brother Bernie to death. But of, course, of course we don't agree on everything because we, we, we jazz folk. It's not about unanimity, but you're looking for some integrity. You're looking for what Jane Austen called constancy. You're looking for consistency. You're looking for somebody who's going to be a thermostat rather than a thermometer. <laughs> you see, a thermostat, what does it do? It shapes the climate of opinion. This is what happened through Occupy. This is what happened through different the Black Lives Matter movement. You shape, social movements shape the climate of opinion. Most politicians check the poll and then tell you what their deepest conviction is. (laughs) They're strategic and Machiavellian and Hobbesian. And of course you gotta be practical, but never confuse prudence with opportunism. We can learn that from our right wing brother Edmund Burke. Read Burke on prudence that goes back to the Renaissance notions of practical wisdom. He's not talking about opportunism. He's not talking about careerism. You read the newspaper these days and they say, anybody who moves to the middle is what? Pragmatic. That's a lie. That's a lie. They're opportunistic. That's not the same thing. William James turns over in his grave. John Dewey break dances in his grave trying to get out and correct. <laughs> Quit using that word. All that effort we put into pragmatism, trying to understand the ways in which it's tied to practical wisdom and has something to do with principles and varying and changing circumstances, is not just opportunistic and accommodating yourself to status quo. The last thing you want to be is just well-adjusted to injustice. That's the last thing you want to be. The last thing you want to be. Well-adjusted to in. I'm just fitting in, fitting in. Well-adapted to indifference. Rabbi Hesher used to say, indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. He's right about that. William James used to say, indifference is the one trait that makes the very angels weep. And that callousness, that coldness, that numbness is what is reinforcing the worst of our collective project together. There was a time in which we used to say, if you really want to keep track of the moral conscious of America, keep track of the major black spokesmen and women. That's Douglas, Ida B. Wells Barnett, A. Philip Randolph, Martin King, Malcolm X. But we live in a time now where even so many black folk have been devoured by commodification, devoured by obsession with success, generating peacocks. Look at me, look at me. I'm so smart, I'm so rich, I'm so famous. You can hear Malcolm X say, peacocks strut because they can't fly. (laughs) 
I'm not impressed by peacocks. No matter how high and far you go up the social ladder, if the hierarchy is still in place and the hierarchy is not being interrogated, called into question and called for transformation, then you're just making those at the top more colorful and reinforcing the same kind of hierarchy that was doing you in when you were at the bottom. <laughs> too narrow, it's too truncated, you see. And the only way that change can come about, and I'm going to end on this line from Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, where he says, examples are the go-kart of judgment. Examples are the go-kart of judgment. It's like the conclusion of a practical Aristotelian syllogism. It's not a proposition. It's an action. It's a praxis. It's a way of life. It's a mode of being in the world. And it depends on what kind of life I attempt to live, you attempt to live in relation to those who came before and in relation to the young people who you will bequeath your tradition to. And we just don't know. We're at such a grim moment right now that it's important for the most part not to become so obsessed with the powers that are pushing us off the cliff with ecological catastrophe impending. Nuclear catastrophe, always a possibility. And we've talked about the economic, political, moral, and spiritual catastrophes. But it's all about what kind of life, what connection with motion, momentum, and movement we will have in our short time in space and time. And that opens it up. That opens it up. We just don't know. The future is always open-ended in that sense. But we should understand the unbelievable sense of urgency and emergency, not just here, but all around the world. Thank you all so very much. We'll save time for questions. Yes, I mean.